Oh, let's get started. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Herman, and today I will be talking about my recent research on towards automatic instrumentation by learning to separate parts in monitoring music. And my advisors are Julia McCauley and Taylor Burke-Patrick. Oh, no, I think I shared the wrong screen, sorry. Cool, so here's the outline of today's talk. So um, to begin with, uh, I will give a high level introduction of this research project. Okay. So our project is motivated by a common functionality on modern keyboards um, called zoning. So zoning is that uh, keyboards today usually allow a musician to play multiple instruments at the same time. Um, so it works like this. So before the performance, the musician has to um, predefine some zones, that is the pitch range on the keyboard and they assign different pitch range to different instruments. And once configured, the notes played in each zone will be automatically uh, assigned to the corresponding instrument when you play the keyboard. However, this is not ideal. So what if we can achieve this without having to define the zones beforehand? And what if we can do better than zoning by dynamically assigning instruments to the nodes being played. Yeah, so that we don't need to get uh, limited by the zones. So um, our, in this project, we are aiming for something more ambitious, which is called automatic instrumentation. So to be clear, uh, we define the process of automatic instrumentation as dynamically assigning instruments to nodes in solo music. And the target ensembles could be a choir, a concert band, a women band, a string quartet, a pop band, or even a full orchestra. So there are two use cases for automatic instrumentation. So first, just like uh, keyboard zoning, we could apply it to um, intelligent musical uh, instruments. So um, for example, as the musician plays on their keyboard, uh, rather than hearing a single instrument being played, we could have it play by a full band, for example. And the other use case is that um, we can apply it to assistive composing tools. So one common approach uh, for composing is to first uh, write a solo music piece on piano or guitar, and then the composer will uh, uh, arrange it to the target um, ensemble. So automatic instrumentation can be useful in, in like arranging um, the solo piano piece to other ensembles as uh, an assistive composing tool. However, there are some challenges here and so, so the first challenge is that it's hard to acquire paired data of solo music and its instrumentation. But fortunately, it's easy to obtain uh, multi-track data sets because we have like MIDI data and lots of different um, like music XML data on, um, online. So it's very easy to get these uh, multi-track data sets. So we propose to down mix these uh, multi tracks to single track mixtures, and then we acquire pair data in this way. The other challenge is that um, doing automatic instrumentation requires domain knowledge for each target instrument that you want to write for. And this involves, um, you, you need to know which pitch, which risons, which chords and sequence are playable in each different instrument. So it's hard for a musician to know all these rules and it's also hard to specify these rules as, a, as some fixed set of rules. So we instead adopt a data-driven approach by machine learning. So to learn these rules from uh, from observing a huge amount of data and then try to understand 
how these instruments work. So here's an overview of the whole pipeline of um, our proposed um, work. So first, we acquire, uh, we down mix multi tracks um, into single track mixtures from a multi track data set to acquire pair data of solo music and its instrumentation. And then we train a parse separation model, which learns to infer the part label for each note in the mixture. So from the mixture at the bottom to the middle of the multi-track music. So we can then approach automatic instrumentation by treating input from the keyboard player as a down-mix mixture and separating out the relevant parts as we have in the multi-track uh, music. So to be clear, um, we define the, um, pass, the task of parse separation as separating parts from their mixture in multi-track music. And this, uh, this definition is actually rather uh, flexible. So a part can be a voice, an instrument, a track, etc. cetera. So here, here's an example. So the input is like a mixture without any instrument information. Yeah, and our target output is uh, the same music, but with different instrumentations. Yeah, so in this example, um, our goal is to predict the labels for each uh, instrument for each single note in the mixture. Yeah. Okay, so next we will talk about some prior work on relevant topics of uh, automatic instrumentation and pass separation. So here's an overview of the scope of uh, music research and relevant topics. So the first relevant topic is voice separation, and it's actually technically a subset of part separation where we restrict each part to be monophonic. And the second one is automatic arrangement, and it's a more general task that involves instrumentation, reharmonization, melody, paraphrasing, or even like orchestra orchestration. And so it's more flexible than automatic instrumentation and involves changing the, the music itself. And even more broad field is uh, music generation. And it basically covers each stage in the music creation workflow from composing to arranging to mixing and mastering. I mean, the full process of music creation. Yeah. So we will discuss relevant works. So there are some prior work on voice separation. So mostly they work on small, carefully annotated pop music data set. So it's actually hard to define voice in pop music. So usually they uh, just uh, annotate the melodies and try to somehow like melody extraction and some allow synchronized or overlapping notes in the voice to um, kind of relax the uh, restriction for voice separation that the voice should be um, monophonic. And some use machine learning models with handcrafted crafted input features to achieve voice separation. So including uh, multi-layer perceptron, CNN, and RSTM. So we will include one of this work for the MLP system as our best line. Yeah. Um, and there are some prior work on automatic arrangement and um, a huge amount of work is focused on uh, reduction. That is to map like a music score for a large ensemble to, um, to arrange it or to reduce it into uh, 
a piece for a specific instrument such as piano, guitar, and bass. So the way they do this is to uh, identify the least important notes to remove so that you can play uh, a smaller subset of the notes on a specific instrument. And some arranged orchestral music from piano. So basically uh, orchestration from piano music, but they did not guarantee that all notes in the input piano map to parts in the output. So um, uh, in contrast, um, our proposed automatic instrumentation, the task of automatic instrumentation do have to um, include all the notes in your input, um, input music in your output. Yeah, and finally, uh, there are also some relevant work that use um, sequential neural networks for, um, for symbolic music, that is uh, music generation. So some use RNNs uh, with event-based representation and some use transformers and some generated multi-track music. Um, so next we will talk about the uh, problem formulation, um, just to be clear. So in this work, we define or um, we represent music as a sequence of notes. So basically a music X is um, denoted by a sequence of notes X1 to Xn, around, uh, I mean, sorted in the temporal order and pitch order. And a node is uh, defined as a tuple of its time, pitch, and optionally duration. Um, so we will have different variants of our models that some of them include duration as input, some didn't. And then each node is associated with a pod label. And as we have said, um, a part can be a voice, an instrument, or a track. It's quite, uh, it's quite flexible in this definition. Yeah. So now um, the part separation is, can be defined as uh, to learn the mapping from the nodes to their part labels. And so in this work, we've plan this ta task of part separation as a sequential multi-track, uh, multi-class classification problem. So just to be clear, the input is X1 to Xn, a sequence of nodes. Um, we have some feature of the nodes, time, pitch, duration, etc. And our output is the labels. So for example, here we have uh, one out of the five instruments here. Okay, so with, um, with this formulation, um, we can, uh, there are actually three classes of part separation models um, in terms of the context given to predict the label for the current node Xi. So there is independent model that we predict the label for the current node uh, without any context. And we have online model uh, that uh, only the past information are given to the model. So from X1 up to Xi minus one. So this is preferable for live performance and other use cases that require real-time outputs because this is uh, a real-time capable um, model. And the other one is offline model that we are given the past and the future information Together, all together to predict the label of the current node Xi. So this can find application and in assistive composing tools where we can look into the future to decide um, what, what instruments to use for the current node. Yeah. So now we will talk about the models and the baseline models we include in our uh, comparison, comparative study. So our proposed models are um, include RSTMs, so long short term memories. And so the, the RSTM model in our case is rather uh, basic. So it's and um, has three layers of like 128 hidden units per layer. 
And so we hope that uh, RSTM can extract a meaningful feature from the input of, um, of the music. And we also include the by RSTM model that uh, are and bidirectional version of the RSTM model. So, so the RSTM model is an online model that can only look at the past, but the BioSTM model is the offline model that uh, can both can see both the past and the future. Yeah, and then we make it like sixty-four hidden units per layer, so that all the all our models have comparable. Um, number of trending per, uh, trendable parameters, so they are comparable. Yeah. And we also include the uh, transformers model. And since our case is not a sequence to sequence model, so we kind of divide the transformer into two parts. So the encoder is something similar to a by RCM, where you can see the past and the future. Um, and so it's an offline model. And we also have the transformer decoder, which is similar to an RSTM, where you can only see the, see the past. So this is achieved by the mask uh, multi-hat attention in the first block. So there's a look at hat mask that block out the future so that um, the, the model can only see the past information to predict. Uh, the for the current uh, note. Okay, so the input features are as follows. So we have time, the onset time for each note, um, and it is represented in a time uh, in time steps. So here is an illustration of uh, time step. So um, we are using metrical timing. So um, we have a quarter note, and then we, we divide each quarter note into um, a fixed number of time steps. And so we measure the onset time uh, in time steps. And we also have pitch as a MIDI note number. So it's basically 0 to 128 uh, defined in the MIDI protocol. And so 60 is for this middle C. And you go up and down for cover the full range of piano and more. Yeah. And we also have duration, um, so the note length, and also in the in the unit of time step. And we also include the frequency of the pitch, and we use the formula for tuning piano. Um, so the frequency would be in hertz. And we also examine the use of uh, an, a more advanced time um, time encoding uh, approach. That is to, uh, rather than um, encode the time, we encode the beat. Um, so the onset time in the unit of beat. And in addition, to get the fine grain uh, position of that note, we also include the position within a beat. So for example, in this example, we have 24 uh, time step in a beat. So a bit here refers to a quarter note. So we have we have a number uh, saying where is the uh, where is the onset in the units of beat, and we also have the fine grain um, position, uh, the number that where this uh, onset is in in this beat. Yeah. So um, so next we will talk about. Uh, the baseline models that we include for comparison, and those are inspired by um, um, common features we we observe in, I mean, heuristic or uh, the the zoning features we observe in modern keyboards. So the first one is zone-based algorithm. So it simulates the common feature in modern keyboards as we discussed earlier. So a pitch range. Um, that is, the zone is pre-assigned for each instrument, and then the notes will be automatically assigned to the corresponding instrument when you play the keyboard. And so the, uh, the zone-based algorithm works like this. We learn the optimal zones uh, from the whole training data set, and then we use these learned zones at test time for all different samples. 
So we learn one zone setting and then apply it to all different samples. Um, and we also include the Oracle case where we compute the optimal zones for each sample individually and use them at test time. That is, um, for Oracle case, we compute the optimal zone for this sample and then apply it to this sample. And then we go for the next zone and then we find the optimal zone and then use it for um, the um, use it for the, the music. So that's it's why it's called Oracle, because in real life, we probably don't have the ground truth to find the optimal zones. And the next baseline model is the crosses pitch algorithm. And it is a heuristic algorithm um, with the assumption that the closer the pitches are, the more likely they belong to the same part. And so, so here's the mathematical um, expression for uh, this algorithm to be clear. So, the, um, so we are trying to predict the uh, yi um, by i hat, which is the prediction. And if xi is an onset, uh, then we simply use it for our yi. So uh, this algorithm requires the onset time for each track for initialization. And for the other nodes, um, we simply find um, we have to keep track of the less active pitches for track j. So, and then for the current PI, the current pitch, so we simply find the, the track that have the closest last uh, active pitch, basically, yeah. And so, in fact, we have like two variants for this uh, algorithm. So if we want to make it, uh, if we want to assume that each part is monophonic, monophonic, then we add a term that takes uh, an additional term where we uh, keep track of like uh, whether the track is active. And if it, it's active, then we add a large number to it so that um, it will not be chosen as a possible track candidate. And if we say at, we set uh, m equals to zero, then this turn just uh, disappear and it just work like closest pitch. Obviously. Yeah. So this is the second baseline model. And the final baseline model is a multi-layer perceptron proposed in uh, prior work for voice separation. And so they use multi-layer perceptrons with handcrafted features as um, indicated in the table here. And so in our implementation, we use three fully connected layers with 128 hidden units each, and we have some modification. So first we remove interval features as there's no upper bound for the number of concurrent nodes. So in this work, uh, they are mostly working on Bach Corel. So there are full voice. So you can kind of encode the intervals between different um, voice and send it as the feature. But in our case, we can have like 10 uh, to 20 concurrent nodes. So it's impossible to encode the intervals. Also, it would be huge for your input uh, vector. And we also change the proximity function to L1 dis distance because um, uh, the fully connected layer is a nonlinear mapping. and the original proximity function is simply a nonlinear version of L1 distance. Um, and also, um, this algorithm actually required the prior prediction to predict for the, um, to, for the current node. So it kind of need, need the um, context uh, around the current node so that it can predict uh, precisely what the instrument is for this current uh, note. So for the Oracle case, uh, we replace uh, error-prone prior predictions with ground truth history labels. And we will see in our result, actually, um, uh, these prior predictions are uh, very, I mean, there are lots of uh, errors in these prior predictions, and it do affect the uh, 
accuracy for this uh, algorithm. Yeah. And so next we will talk about the data. So to uh, examine the effectiveness of uh, our proposed model, we consider four data set and they are diverse in their genres, size, and ensembles. So they are um, Bach chorales, string quartets, uh, game music, and pop music. So um, for more details, like Bach chorales are all the chorales work for Bach, and string quartets are, um, are from a data set called uh, MusicNet, and it has like many uh, famous composers uh, work on string quartets. And Game Music is a data set called NES, um, NES Music Database. So NES is a game console from Nintendo in the early time. And, and so this data set has um, some game music that uh, are being played or being used in this, uh, these games in NES console. And public data set is from uh, Lock MIDI data set. It's a huge, uh, uh, a huge MIDI collection, and we only extract the uh, pop music so pop songs. Yeah. So we can see that um, these data sets are like like brand from very small to very large. And we also have different ensembles, like Bach Chorales is a choir work. So um, we have soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. And string quartets, we have two violins, one viola, and one cello. And for the game music, we have three um, synthesizers or generators. Um, so we have two pause wave generator and one triangle wave. And for pop music, we um, we only consider five instruments, piano, guitar, bass, strings, and brass. Uh, these are the most common uh, instruments used in the data set. Yeah. So one thing to be um, noticed here is that um, actually we find that uh, in pop music data set, um, the guitar represents like 42% of the labels. So that means like, for any baseline model, if you simply uh, predict guitar as the, the, the label and like always predict guitar, then you will get 42.5% accuracy. So that's kind of the, um, the baseline. Like we, could, we should always be better than this. Yeah. Okay. So, so all these data sets are uh, like in noisy in some way, so we have to do some data cleansing. So um, these are the details, and so so um, basically for pop music data set, um, we as we said, like we have uh, the five most common instruments, and this is uh, based on the general MIDI one specification. And in general MIDI one, there are like 128 different instruments and every 16 instruments of them are mapped to a family. So piano, you have different version, uh, different variants of piano, like sometimes organ are also uh, classified as piano and you have classic piano, you have grand piano, you have rock piano. And for guitar, you have acoustic guitar, electric guitar. So um, we, we we map uh, the instrument families of the piano families into the piano track. So that's how we get the five uh, most common instruments. Um, let's say that's how we get the training data of five uh, instruments. And by merging these uh, tracks in the same instrument families. And we also have some data preprocessing. And so once again, uh, we are using um, metric timing. So we have um, a time step correspond to some fraction of a quarter note. Yeah. But for game music, uh, we don't actually have that. So we have to, uh, we don't have the metric timing uh, information. That is the music is recorded in real time and we don't know whether it is a quarter note or it's a full note. 
etc. So um, in game music, we use absolute timing, but we try to downsample it to a temporal resolution equivalent to that we use in the other data set. Okay, so here comes the experiments and our results. So the, here are some implementation details. So um, one thing to be noticed is that uh, we clip the time by like uh, 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 an upper bound and the beat and duration or time information by an upper bound so that we can fit it into uh, the embedding layer. Yeah. So these are the details. Okay, so here are the results. So first we have the um, bar corrals. Um, so just to be clear, uh, here we only represent um, um, samples they, that are um, that are that contains more errors because like mostly like in for bar corrals, it's usually a perfect prediction and we can achieve a very high accuracy in general. So here's the input. And so here's the target output. Yeah, to be clear, it, it, it should be um, should be for SATB like choir, but because um, mod usually synthesizer, our synthesizer doesn't have those uh, sound fonts or uh, those tones, so we, we render it in winds. And so you can see that uh, actually the offline by RSDM gives a perfect prediction at the bottom. And the online RSTM only make a mistake in the baseline, in the best baseline. So we won't play again because it's basically uh, the same, just a tiny um, arrow. And next we have the string cortex from uh, string cortex, and here is one example for Beethoven's string cortex number eleven. So let me play the input. Yeah, so, um, so, so here are some of the difficulties of this example. So you can see that there are tremolos for the first violin, the blue ones. Um, so you can see the tremolos. And so it's hard to predict this actually. And we also have uh, the double stops for um, the, the second violin and the viola and the cello, and they are actually overlapping uh, with overlapping pitch range. So this make it very hard to predict. And there are also like very um, high notes for the bass. So, and so if you use like zone based algorithm, then it will not possible to predict this as the bass because bass is C, the pitch range of viola in this case. So, um, so here's the uh, target output. And so we can see that uh, for the online RSTM, it doesn't work well for uh, this case, but you can see that for the offline by RSTM, it actually can somehow um, uh, do better than the, uh, uh, the RSTM version. So you can see the VLR is somehow being extracted, but I mean, overall, it's not doing great on this example because this example has like very complex texture. So this is the virus deal one. OK, 
Okay, so next we have the game music from NES, NES console, like the, the top right illustration. Um, so here we have the input. So a very classic game music, like a bit music. And so our ground truth is like um, three different uh, generators instead of like one single tone. So here's the target output. Yeah, so the most noticeable uh, difference is in the bass line. So the bass notes are played by a different in, uh, uh, generator. And it's actually hard to um, tell the, the two um, top generators, uh, I mean, two tones for the blue and orange uh, voice. And so you can see the, the output for our models doesn't do a good job on um, separating out the blue and the orange one. And because there is like the blue notes are um, using like long notes, but the orange notes are using like um, very short notes and there's a, a, a visualization or say a, a slope there. So this is the offline biosteam prediction. Yeah, so, so the difference is quite subtle, but if you listen to it carefully, then you will hear the difference in the two tones. And it's kind of, um, um, if you compare the ground truth to the um, virus DM prediction, then you will hear the difference when the tone is being changed or swapped during performance. It's kind of uh, distracting, yeah. And finally, we have the um, pop music. So this is Planet on the Boogie by the Jacksons. Yeah, so the mixture, our input is using guitar to synthesize it because guitar is the most common label, like which represents 40% of the data set. And here's our target output, which is quite hard actually like a full band, oops. Yeah, so uh, notice that uh, there's actually a, a, a melody uh, behind these um, chords played by the piano. The blue one are the piano and the orange one are the guitar. And so the dark uh, brown uh, pitches here are the, uh, the melody played by guitar behind the piano. Yeah. So we can see that the Aristia model doesn't do a good job on extracting those melody, like separating out melody from uh, the underlying chords. Yeah, so, so the Aristian model used the same instrument guitar for the, the melodies and the chords, so it can be quite, uh, I mean, it's somehow overlapping and you cannot hear the melodies clearly. But for the virus DM, the, uh, the melody and the chords are perfectly separated and they use, um, uh, I mean, they are using different instruments. So to sum up for the qualitative results, we have some representative error case. I mean, mostly um, the accuracy is high and so the model are doing great, great and, but there are still some um, error cases. So first are, um, is the overlapping pitch range for chords or um, uh, for two polyphonic instruments, for example, here in the string quartets. And we also have a hard case for overlapping um, melodies and chords. So you see the melodies behind the, um, behind the chords. And we also have this 
very um, hard case that we have a sequence of short notes crossing a single low note. And this is actually quite common in the game music data set. So in game music, usually you have this um, kind of pattern, like very visually <laughs> perfect pattern in game music because it's, uh, it's produced on the uh, on computer rather than uh, real time performance. So we can have like very like triangle shaped, U shaped things in the game music, like quite common. So here are the quantitative results. So we report uh, the accuracy for different models, including our proposed RSTM transformers and the baseline model um, and on the four different data sets. So, so first, we see that um, our proposed models uh, outperform baselines. So um, to be clear that like RSTM performed the best for this category for the online models and offline models by RSTM as the best, uh, the highest accuracy. And in general, um, not in general, I mean, for all this case, uh, by RSTM outperforms RSTM because and it is reasonable because um, uh, BIOSDM have a say, access to future information while RSDM only, can only look at the past. And we, we also see that RSDM models outperform transformer models. And so RSDM outperform transformer decoder, BIOSDM outperform transformer encoder. So this is possibly because uh, we are not using the full transformer architecture, which is for sequence to sequence learning. And we are kind of breaking into two parts and like use it as a RSDN and BIOSDN. So um, it's not performing as well, uh, as good as uh, uh, the RSDN models, but transformer models benefit from uh, faster inference speed at test time because it used CN, um, not CN, I mean, because of the design of the model. Yeah. So it can be easily parallelized. Okay, so, and next we also, um, um, so here we see that like, um, we compare the MLT baseline with the uh, Oracle case for the MLT baseline. So we can see that um, with Oracle, actually, this algorithm can perform quite well. And so I think, uh, so we think that the problem is that arrows can propagate over time as this MLT models kind of uh, predict each node independently without the, uh, like having a sequence model that encodes the context or the past. So this actually emphasizes the need to incorporate sequential models for this test. And finally, um, we see that um, the proposed models perform relatively poorly on string cortex and game music. And we think this is because that uh, string cortex has two violins and game music have like two very similar pulse wave generators. And it's actually, they are actually sometimes used interchangeably. So, um, it's hard to tell one from the other. So this motivates us to examine the use of pitch hints and entry hints that I will be introducing now. So these are hints for controllability so that the musician can provide to the model for additional information. So pitch hints are the average pitch for each part. So this can be helpful for differentiating instruments that are used interchangeably. For example, the two violins or the two post waves. And we also examine another type of uh, hints that is the entry hints. So it encodes the onset position for each instrument. So as the example shown here, the guitar, um, so it's in encoded as a unit step function centered at its onset point. So for example, um, for the guitar, it start at the beginning and in the middle, piano join and string join at the last and bass was never used. So this is kind of similar to that, like in closest pitch algorithm, we have to initialize our model. So entry hint is kind of um, an initialization for our models. So, and 
these two types of hints uh, allow the musicians to use interactively. So you can uh, sort of make the instrumentation process more controllable with some very tiny overheads of like, where did you start playing this uh, instrument or like what's the average pitch for uh, this part? So now um, we can see that with the help of uh, entry hints, uh, we still got the similar result. So since classes, uh, closest pitch algorithm use entry hints, so the closest pitch um, algorithm for into these categories. And once again, we see that uh, proposed models outperform baselines for the closest pitch algorithm. And similarly, BiosDM outperforms LSDM, LSDM models outperform transform models. And finally, uh, one thing very interesting is that the closest pitch algorithm, and if we add the monophonic assumption, it actually can uh, achieve a surprisingly high accuracy, like 89.76%. Um, it's close to the, um, to the LSDM models for the Baco rails. So, so maybe that's uh, because Bach Corels have like very strict rules in the each voice and you have to follow this kind of um, rules that like clo closer pitch uh, should be in the same, um, uh, in the same voice. Okay. okay, and next we, we Examine the effects of different input features. So we discussed lots of different input features. So we have a uh, pitch beat and position embedding. So we can either encode these things, uh, pitch in row number, or we use an embedded layer. And we also examine whether duration help for the RSTM. And we also examine entry hints and pitch hints. So here are the results. So first we see that, um, Embedding is quite crucial for the performance for the string, game, and pop music data set. But for Bach Corrales, um, embedding doesn't help a lot. And we suspect that uh, it is because for Bach Corrales, mostly you can use the pitch to uh, predict the, I mean, you can use something similar to zooming for the Bach Corrales that like highest pitch for, go for soprano and lowest pitch go for bass. For Bacarel, so it can already achieve high accuracy with the pitch information. And now the duration helps for the Bacarels and pop music and uh, for most data sets. And this is the RSTM model, not the bi RSTM model, so that the result can be comparable. And also we see that like entry hints, um, when we add entry hints to the model that uh, then uh, the performance improve for the game music and the string quartets. So here, because we have two uh, interchangeably, kind of <laughs> interchangeably violins in string quartets and basically interchangeable uh, pulse wave generators, two pulse wave generators in the game music. So the, uh, the gain of the performance is quite, uh, quite significant. And finally, pitch hints, with pitch hints is even more useful than the entry hints. However, pitch hint is kind of um, an oracle information that, because um, you have to know the full piece so that you can compute the average pitch for each, um, each track. But if you have those information, then uh, the string and the game music can be um, like separate out in the very, high accuracy. Actually, the best uh, performing uh, model is the one with pitch hints for the string and game music. And for Bach and Pop, uh, we actually have like, uh, those hints actually are not used for, um, for these. Cool. Um, okay. And also, uh, we have two experiments on the time encoding and the augmentation. So we also examine four strategies for time encoding in music. So we represent music in row time as a number and the beat position decomposition. 
And we also have embedding version, like we use additional embedding layer after the time or after the beat and position. So we can see that um, beat and position embedding is quite critical for um, the game and pop music because they are harder data sets. But for Baco Rails, um, um, they are similarly performing. Uh, I mean, they perform, in, perform similarly. And, and also, as I said, that uh, Baco Rails usually rely more on the pitch rather than the time. And so for the pop music, we can see that like the pop music data set is the hardest and the largest data set and the most diverse data set. And we can see that uh, if we use um, uh, embedding, it improves. And if we use beat and position decompositions, um, and it, it can achieve the highest accuracy across different settings. And finally, uh, we also uh, examine the effects of data augmentation. So we have three strategies. So either um, no augmentation at all, or we have light augmentation where we randomly transpose uh, each song um, by minus one or plus one or no uh, semitones. And strong augmentation, that is that we randomly transport each sample by negative five to plus six semitones. So negative five to plus six actually cover the full octave. So the strong augmentation actually is equivalent to random uh, to transpose each sample to a random key in the, uh, the whole octave. So each key will be equally likely to happen in our data set in the strong, if we use the strong augmentation strategy. So we can see that for game music and pop music data set. So these data set, um, we typically don't have those kind of very strict rules on the key that are playable. So we can easily transpose them on, uh, on um, digital audio workstation or um, computers. So we can see that strong augmentation actually help a lot in this two data set. But for Bach and string, Bach rails and string cortex, like no augmentation actually works uh, the best because um, Bach rails and string cortex are classical music. And in classical music, we usually don't have like very weird key uh, in classical music. So if you transpose it into a wrong key, then you kind of lost the information of like what exactly uh, pitch can be played on certain um, instruments. Yeah. Cool. Um, and so for the pop music data set, you can see that uh, the more the augmentation is, then the, uh, the, highest, the higher the accuracy is. And finally, we because we are uh, trained and test on the same data set. So we, we want to test if the data set can be um, generalized to other data sets. So we, trend, we, we apply our model trend on the pop music uh, data set, that is the LMD data set, uh, and we test it on the pop 909 data set. So pop 909 data set is a pop song data set, um, and it's a piano version of the pop song. So um, let's listen to it and you will see. Um, so here's the input. Yeah, so basically piano version for pop song. And so um, here with the zone based uh, model, um, we can have this kind of result. Yeah, so as you can hear, uh, the, the, because um, we are using like the zone learned on the uh, pop music data set, not on the pop 909 data set. And actually pop 909 doesn't have any instrument um, labels that you can learn from. So the zone based uh, model like 
assign the highest pitch to like very high pitch to strings, so it can be quite distracting when they change the instruments for the melody one. And here's the output for the Parisian. So again, it's not like doing well. So for the offline virus DM, it actually can some, somehow extract the medley lines. Yeah, so as we can see that uh, the bias DM model can somehow perform the task of like melody extraction in this case yeah. and but for for other cases like this is one of the best sample i observe and for other cases because the input is a, a, a piano music and most time the the bias dm rsdm model just think that oh they are they are piano music so they just simply classify it all the notes to piano so we're just kind of boring, and I do think there are more um, things could be done, like we can uh, introduce like transfer learning or other techniques so that it works better in out of distribution testing. Yeah, okay, so that's the result part. So finally, we will for the discussion and conclusion. So first, we would like to talk about the ambiguity of this task. So automatic instrumentation is essentially a one-to-many mapping. There's never only one way to um, um, do, auto, uh, do instrumentation for uh, a song. So for example, this song, Kondo, uh, Kondo, Kondo. So this is the uh, original instrumentation. And this is the result for RSTM without entry hint, so the model doesn't know like uh, string was not used in this case. So it actually used string for the brass part. And this is the version that by RSTM produced. So from the um, musical perspective, I think those three instrumentations are, um, are all reasonable um, like rearrangement for the original uh, music. So, I mean, there's no uh, standard answer for this question. So it's basically a one to uh, many mapping. So, so here comes the limitation of our work. So, so first, like um, part separation is not a perfect surrogate task for automatic instrumentation. So in this work, we we use uh, the task of um, part separation as an to approach automatic instrumentation. But first, uh, input mixtures uh, in part separation might not be playable, and also. Um, um, as I said in the previous slide, that uh, automatic instrumentation is not a uh, one-to-one -one mapping, so it needs to balance between accuracy and diversity. So in this case, it's more toward like automatic arrangement music generation, so it could benefit from generative modeling. So future directions, so first, like uh, we could do it better in using generative uh, modeling for automatic instrumentation, so to learn the one-to-many mapping. And we could also try uh, unpaired automatic instrumentation because we are easy to find solo music and we are easy to find um, body track music. So can we unsupervisedly learn an automatic instrumentation models from two collections of solo music and body track music? And finally, um, it's in large-scale pre-training for symbolic music models. So part separation as a task 
could be an additional source of music knowledge supervision for trending um, symbolic music models, and it might be able to improve performance for other downstream symbolic music tasks. So the conclusion, um, first we propose a new task of pod separation and we flame it as a sequential multi-class classification problem. And we also examine the feasibility of this task under both the online and the offline setting. And we show that our proposed model outperform different baselines and we um, conduct a empirical evaluation over four diverse data set, Bach chorales, string quartets, game music, and pop music. And we present promising results for applying process separation models to automatic instrumentation. And finally, there are some ambiguity of the task and we suggest future direction. Um, so this is the end of my talk. Um, so I welcome any questions.